Hello again folks and welcome once more to another Wii Gamers video and yes we are talking about airships the North Pole Quest once again if you're tired of listening to it then you know just don't play the video go away and do something else nobody's making you watch it but still five days to go with um, airships North Pole Quest so we wanted to give you a little bit of more sort of info on how it actually plays because obviously this is one that we are quite smitten with uh, and have indeed backed. And we've been fortunate enough to get to play this a couple of times on Tabletop Simulator. Now TTS is okay. Now I'll admit quite happily I'm not a big fan of playing digitally. Got me consoles like my retro games but you know that's a box that's ticked and you kind of stay there and you do that. But board games digitally, that's for playing on the train or something on your iPad or your phone because you just want to be antisocial and not talk to anybody. But board games are better being board games. That's my humble opinion. But that's not what this argument's about. So, just to kind of refresh where we are with that, I'm going to call up the, uh, the Kickstarter here. Um... Not that you need me to rattle through the Kickstarter again. There's a couple of things I suppose we could shout out. But we could shout about the fact that they're they're nearly 56,000, which is awesome. Uh, still five days to go at the time of recording this. And since we tend to be quite quick at firing out of videos, there'll probably still be five days to go. Unless you're watching this two days from now. In which case there'll be three days to go. Or something like that. Anyway, that's not important. So what is important is the fact that there are loads of pledges that you can go for here and an awful lot of stuff has been unlocked. But there's a couple of little elements of it that don't come across in TTS that I thought might just be as well kind of shown here rather than anywhere else. One of the things is the navigation tools. There they are uh, there on the screen. The navigation tools don't really work very well on the tabletop simulator. Now you're probably wondering, well, you know, why, why do I care? Why are you telling me this? We've got a little bit of a recording from our last go on TTS, which I want to show you, because it does present the game board and the components fairly well. So we do want to show you that. We were going to sort of use it as straight footage and go, here's a game being played, but because of this and a couple of other things, we don't feel it actually... It, it, we don't feel it actually does justice to the game in itself for that. So the navigation tools, there they are. The sort of triangular one is for sort of being blown off course. Uh, so you can be knocked off by a number of degrees on your flight path. And indeed, if you've got a, a bad headwind or a storm, you can actually be blown backwards, driven back. So these markers sort of determine how that all happens. And then for actual verti or vertical movement, uh, for horizontal movement of your airship and your ocean going liner, you'll use this uh, range calculator down here. These are kind of done for you through digital rulers on the TTS. The control boards all work grand, though that has been upgraded now through the Kickstarter. There were little sort of counters that you would put on this to record your fuel and your damage. These are now done with a slider and a little plastic sort of arrow and actual sort of fuel gauge thing. So those have been uh, improved on as well. The cards in TTS are all still in um, Italian. So three types of cards. Your mission cards give you a kind of a selection of where you're going to start from, where you have to get to. These are how you will complete missions and earn bonds. Bonds being the finance, the, the, the currency of the game world. And you'll need to generate bonds in order to pay for fuel, to pay landing fees at different sites, to rent your campsite for your uh, Arctic uh, challenge, to erect your mast and to hire crew and things like that there and pay for repairs and whatnot too. Strategy cards are kind of challenge cards. You will incur these more than earn them because normally the effects of them can be a bit detrimental. So things like going through minefields in the sea or crossing over mountain ranges, uh, trying to fly during bad storms, things like that, will encounter, will encounter venture cards, sorry, venture cards. Whoa, we, we totally messed that one up. So strategy cards are tactics. They're dirty tricks that you'll get to play on other people. They're the blue ones. 
and they are also sort of little boons and bonuses you can play on yourself. So it could be things like doubling the cost of fuel, or it could be having the cost of repairs, things like that, amongst a multitude of others. The venture cards then are the ones you will incur rather than earn uh, for the aforementioned minefields, mountains, uh, risk and bad weather. And these will generally be bad. And, and you don't want them, but sometimes it adds a bit of drama, and the odd one can actually be good, so, you know, but, yeah, adventure cards, not good. If you can force other people to have to take them, much better. The wind indicator here, this is a big part of it, because the board for uh, airships actually runs under it it's got two sort of things going on with the board and the little dials underneath will change on the map where the weather and what the wind effects are that can be done on tts and obviously this dial can be done on tts these things were represented with dice rolls in the uh, the digital version so it'll be lovely to actually get to grips when the real thing finally lands and be able to see this in action core game this is one of those games that I will totally forgive people who just want to buy it to put on a shelf, okay? Because, yes, this is the one to buy if you just want to play with it. That, that's cool. It's, it's a standard sort of game. But when you race all the way down here, you get the fancy collector edition in a wooden box. And I can forgive anyone for wanting that. I would if I could, but I can't. Because, you know, there's bills to pay and stuff. Um, and if that's not fancy enough for you, don't forget that you can chug, 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 chug also get your museum display case. They just stick that on the wall with your little metal airships that are already painted for you and have little decals on it. Oh, a boy can dream. Um, and there's even fancier ones where you can get like the really nice airships book, which is like a, an entire sort of history of uh, airships, their construction, their adventures and all that sort of stuff. Decals upgrade there as well, lovely. And if you race all the way down, somewhere near the very bottom is the kind of, you know, for the absolute dedicated fan, there is a table. You can get your own bespoke table for it. Let's just take a moment to appreciate that, because that's lush. But anyway, that's not gonna happen to mere humble human beings like us over here. In Ireland, no, 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 no. That's that's not how life works. So, if we then uh, nip on over, because over on the other page, uh, we've got the uh, the old video rattling away here for you. So yeah, there we go. So this is the uh, tabletop simulator. I I'm not a good enough pilot on tabletop simulator to even begin to try and sort of have coordinated taking you through a literally guided tour here okay and uh, that that would be next to impossible uh, it would take a better pilot and it would take slightly more time what was actually happening here was the team from Hunt and the Sun were running a game uh, for another lad from the states who wanted to get a bit of a handle on it for writing a review so he was sort of getting to grips with what was going on. I was kind of hovering in the background. End up getting to play an extra couple of rounds of the game as well. But you are getting a fairly good look at the board. It's done in an era uh, specific sort of set of colors. The map, all the places, the place names. This isn't an updated map. This is sort of going right back to the, to the proper stuff. So you will see a few places that you kind of think, oh, it's not what that's called. Um, you know, not to get your knickers in a twist, it's trying for historical accuracy. You've got your Arctic Circle there, which generally speaking is a no fly zone uh, for the duration of the game. And then you have a number of sort of different marks around this map. Now, we will sort of zoom in and zoom out as the video rattles away here. And as it does, I will try when I can to sort of draw your attention as appropriate to what I think you need to see. So one of the things that you can see quite nicely from this sort of aerial photograph is the overall layout and generally speaking the components. Obviously you've got your board slap bang in the middle there. Then to our top left 
we have four of the airship cards. There are obviously now seven, but there's four out for the purposes of the demo that was under uh, taken here. Immediately below that, we have a selection of four commanders that were selected for the demo that the guys and girls were doing. We have a number of crew tokens. We've got two uh, wind uh, direction dials there, the sort of triangular devices. Straight below us then, we have the player pieces in the player colours, two range rulers. Now, they do work in the digital game, but they don't work very well. There's, there's not enough space and things bounce off each other a bit too much. Got some blank cards just for writing notes. We have then to the left the other captains that haven't been used at the minute. And just above those, the three decks of cards, the strategy, venture and mission cards. And a fancy little clock on the table that's of no real relevance or importance to anybody. Now, with the wonders of high-tech, we can do sort of zoom-ins here and sort of show you little bits and pieces. So, just to sort of take a moment uh, where we are with that, you can see there, obviously, we've got land, we've got the oceans, but we have the little dots with sort of circles around them and the names. These are locations, these are places you can fly to, you can stop at, you can hire crew, you can refuel, all that. The dot is the actual place. The little circle is kind of considered to be the sphere of influence. So as long as the base of your airship makes it inside that circle, you're considered to be close enough to do a landing and avail of the facilities at that site. Then you've got kind of little grey circles. You'll see a couple of them in that shot. And we'll see if we can get you a slight, there we go, slightly better ones there. In fact, this, this does a perfect job because we've got two kind of large grey circles uh, in the ocean here. These are actually windows. They're, they're little holes in the board. And underneath that will be the weather dials that rotate around showing us the different sort of uh, weather effects in the different regions of the boards. They're all over the place, land and sea. But then we've got a small chain of uh, similar dots, but slightly smaller, just down the spine of Scotland and England there and running sort of underneath uh, Scandinavia. Those are minefields, leftovers from the Great War. And they pose a risk to shipping. So you will have an ocean-going vessel which carries your camp and carries your mast for erecting up at the Arctic Circle. It has to get to the Arctic Circle and depending on where you start, it may well end up sailing through a minefield or two and running the risk of a few problems as a result of that. Those little close-ups though do give you an impression and I think it's a fairly honest impression of the sort of the color and quality and the look of the game board as well. And I think that's the main thing that the team have worked on the TTS version. Yes, you can play a version of the game. You can't play the true version of the game. But you certainly get the sense of how it feels. They've... They've pushed the boat out as far as I think they could to make this look and feel the part. Now, we should be able to scrub forward a little bit here. And there we go. We'll get up uh, a little bit closer to a couple of the uh, ship's dials. Um, we'll probably end up sort of racing through these a little bit. But that sort of gives you a, a capture of most of it. So you've got this this command card. These are all sort of embossed now, so they've got little recesses for your tokens. So at the bottom here we have four crew spaces. You have space for um, an engineer, you have space for a meteorologist, you have space for a journalist, and you have space for a pilot or a navigator. And each of these types of crew member will bring bonuses. And you sort of think, well, what bonus does a journalist bring me? Journalists will bring you an income every round through basically advertising and selling your story, which is all very good. To the top right, we've got our fuel dial. That's now been upgraded as well to actually have a needle instead of a token. And you sort of burn fuel every round that you move. 
and that'll need topped up. And I think we've just gone out of shot on it. Don't know if we can we can catch it in this one. Might be able to. Um, no, we can't. Uh, well, well, it will come up again shortly. But there is a, a there is a close up of one of the, our cards that we'll show you. So there's like the opening hands being dealt, where they're getting three mission cards and three strategy cards. And you're allowed to sort of spend actions to swap out some cards as well if you want. You have to declare your missions so they kind of go open form onto the table. So everyone knows where you're trying to get to. And that might help give them a clue as to uh, strategy cards to play on you to try and uh, mess with your plans. Racing around here, you can get an impression of my bad piloting as I try to uh, get around the table and get a view of my ship's card. Which, yeah, there we go. It ended up going sideways. And I think I ended up uh, turning me round instead of it. Um, so that gives you a much better look at one of the actual ship command cars there. And these are the damage points. The 1, 2 and 3 just running up sideways on the left hand edge are damage points that the, the ship can take structure points. And having a mechanic board allows you to ignore once in the game. Um... A point of damage and uh, also gives you a better chance of repairing said damage if you make a safe harbor but this is the the real ship and sort of the the stats are appropriate to it the range that it has and the fuel capacity it had and who its support and vessel where it starts and where its support vessel starts as well so we jump through a little bit more footage and again making you suffer what I'm trying to do uh, on the screen. So once you've got your ship selected, um, the next thing that tells you where your airship's going to go on the map and you'll plop your airship counter down at that. It tells you where your support vessel starts and you'll plop that down as well. And then you'll take a little flag, a little tent and a little mast token in your team colours. The flag is used to help you and your teammates figure out where you're trying to go to at any given time because you've always got to be going to somewhere. The tent is used whenever you declare a base camp. Uh, up in the Arctic Circle region here there are a number of sites that can be hired uh, to be used as a base camp uh, for your operation. That's where your, your vessel, your ocean going vessel's got to get to. Um, but once you pay and rent, you can put your camp, your tent on it to sort of, I've claimed it, I've paid me rent, I just haven't got there yet. Now, of course, there's a lot of tricks. There's a lot of this space belongs to the USSR. There's quite a bit of this space belongs to Great Britain. And if you are one of those nation states that has territory in the Arctic Circle, you can set up your base for free. You still have to pay to erect your uh, airship mast for mooring, but you'll get your base for free. If you are not fortunate enough to be one of those nations, you will have to pay ground rent. And if it is to one of those nations and they are in the game, you're actually giving them money. So got to think about that one too. Once you have sort of sorted out your components, once you've sorted out uh, the location of your bits and pieces, um, the next thing before, and you've got your cards, the next thing of course is that you have to get an actual captain. Now I figured we had a close up of the captain cards there, well you'll see there's three of the standees there, somebody's already selected a standee at this point. Um, but the standee cards again there, well, there's one. There's, oh, unfortunately, again, my captaining of this uh, this digital experience not uh, not the best, unfortunately. But essentially, the standees themselves uh, all have sort of their name on it, and they'll have three or four um, statistics. And depending on what sort of mode of the game you're playing. Generally speaking, there's only one of those going to be of relevance, whether they're like an investor and give you more money, whether they're a pilot, give you better uh, captaining skills, or they might be a scientist and give you a bonus to meteorology. And that's a double bonus on top of any crew that you happen to buy as well. And once you've got your captain, you're ready to kick off. And the gameplay after that is, 
It's reasonably simple and straightforward. Basically, the first player will declare a mission. They'll flip over their mission card to show it. They'll take their flag. They'll place it on where they're going to go to. And then they will use one of their actions. Now, you'll have sort of three actions every round. You can move your airship, you can move your ocean going ship, you can swap some cards out, you could refuel, you could do repairs, whatever you need to do. You can combine your actions to do a number of things. Um, bidding is used to resolve uh, the sort of desire for a particular captain. So if you decide that you're going to take a particular captain, you're the first person going there's a bidding round where other people have the chance to kind of snipe in and that that balances out the fact of sort of who's going first, second, third. They don't just get to take the cool stuff and walk away. At the worst case, they still get it, but they've had to pay a bit more for it. And usually they can afford to do that. Um, so you'll play your mission card, you'll put your flag down, and you'll start moving your bits and pieces. And you will use the range rulers to help calculate your movement. And it is, it has that, whilst it's not cumbersome, it has that kind of feel of navigating and looking at those old maps. You see in films and having compasses and set squares and all sorts of things. You'll put your range ruler down, you'll move, you'll check your range, you'll check your fuel, you'll move your, your ship, you'll adjust your counters. And off you go. And the same with your ocean going vessel. Now the map obviously has areas, narrow rivers and little passes and that. The map isn't massively huge. But basically if there is a waterway your ship can pass through it. Your ship model is literally nothing more than a token to register the fact that it's that's a boat. Um, so don't get too caught up on the fact that you know it looks like it's sitting in the middle of a land mass. When in actual fact it's on a river. Um... I'm trying to think what's trying. It, it's sort of when you're trying to play it back in your head. What else? What else do you need to know? That that's kind of loosely speaking the turn sequence. You do your do your movements. Uh, if you pass through any mountain ranges, if you pass through any uh, minefields, that you'll draw a venture card and deal with the consequences of that. And anywhere in your turn, you can play strategy cards. You can play them against opponents as well. Um, so you can sort of play a card in your round that will inhibit them in their next round. I uh, ended up being sort of run aground a couple of turns where my ship was hindered from getting to my landing site, which was very annoying. You can select more missions as well. If things are going in your favour or you find a mission pretty hard, you can swap a mission out, draw a different card, uh, hope for a better one. It does really pay in this to look at the missions you're dealt and think about them because if you've got cards that take you from like Europe to America and then into the Soviet Union and then back into Europe, you are going to be spending an awful long time and a lot of travel and a lot of refueling. Where's the money going to come to pay for that? But the idea is that what you want to have happen then is that you are getting into that uh, Arctic Circle, Arctic region there where you can plant your mast and then your airship has to get to you there, moor up, refuel, and then make a run for the very centre of the board, for the North Pole, and back without refueling again to wherever you have built your camp. Now, all the airships have different fuel capacities, all the airships have different ranges, the crew that you can hire add bonuses to these, uh, but the strategy cards that other people play and the damage they take can uh, be modifying that in a, in a negative way. So there's a real timing element to when to play cards that are going to help you, when to play cards that are going to hinder your opponents, which crew to take, which crew not to waste money on either. Um, because all of these things uh, can sort of come back to haunt you once you make that challenge for the North Pole. And that's it. To, to, the winner is the first person who makes it there and back to their base camp. That's that's game over. In a lot of ways, I can totally accept that this maybe doesn't sound at first glance like the most exciting thing in the world. Um, but it is. <laughs> that's pretty, pretty much all I can tell you. It, it is. It, there's so many little strategies at play. The feel of it's beautiful. 
and and that for me is something about this game that works beyond the pure mechanics of it. There's a nice feel to this game. This isn't going to be a game for everybody. There won't be enough player interaction for a lot of people. There won't be enough strategy for every player. There won't be enough variation in airships for every player because at its foundation this is based on real airships and what they could do, the historic background of them. And then they've added a game layer to that information. And then they've gone away and looked at that game layer and said, well, okay, we know how we would like it to work because we're engineers, we're pilots, we're aviators. But to make this a board game, it needs to do other things. And to be fair, they've gone away, they've talked to people who make board games, who play board games, and they've brought those other things to it. I would say this is a medium weight game. It's not too heavy. There's not a whole pile of sort of mass and thinking. It's, it is fun, but it's got a little bit more bite than say something like Ticket to Ride. Okay, Ticket to Ride, down there, nice, easy, all round family game. Um, it's, it's climbed up above that. It's above the clouds. It's not trains, it's airships. But you're not building routes, you're just trying to complete them with proper planning of your journeys, managing your fuel, managing your budget. But by the same token, it's not, you know, you're not sitting there with an abacus and a calculator trying to figure that out either. It's fun. They have taken something that looks beautiful, something that's built firmly on the historical information, and they've brought a fun level of gameplay to it. And I think anyone that gets their chance to sort of look at this properly and get a play at it is going to be quite pleased with it. But you have to give that caveat, don't you? You can be quite pleased with it, but not everyone's going to love it. There will be people who kind of look at this and go, oh, right, that's it. That, that's, that's all this game is. And there will be people who go, hmm, that's a lot to take on board. Horses for courses. You can't please everyone and you can't make everybody happy. But hopefully that manages to give you some semblance of the flow of it. As I say, you'll pick a ship, you'll pick a captain, you'll hire a crew, you'll get your cards. Each turn you will select from your available actions to move ship, airship, hire people, fire people, refuel, play cards on your opponents, play cards to your own benefit. Play will go around. As you complete those journeys, you're tallying up your bonds, you're paying for your camp, you're paying for the erection of your airship mast at the Arctic Circle camp, and then you're making that bid for your camp, getting a final refuel, and then making that race for the North Pole and back to your camp before any of your opponents can do it. All the time fighting each other and the board, because remember the board is going to be giving you those weather effects and climatic issues that are going to play havoc with you. We were only using dice on the TTS version, but the number of times I ran into storms and rain and fog banks, all of which you reduce your movement, slow your movement, or if you keep pushing through it, will damage your airship. So there's a lot to sort of balance and play with there. The fact that the Kickstarter has the option for other game modes coming into it only bodes well because my humble opinion is that this is too beautiful to just leave for one style of gameplay. We have solo mode already in the bag. If it gets a few more quid into its kitty, it will add in the uh, the treasure hunt game. And I think there's more beyond that could be could be done here too. Something in my head says there's there's some sort of spy kind of Cold Warish almost could be uh, could be played with here. And certainly steampunk vibes too. Um, I see no reason why this game couldn't involve uh, fictitious ships and fictitious captains of a more fanciful nature as well. Perhaps you agree, perhaps you disagree. Uh, the decision, as they say, will remain with yourself. But that's it for now. That's sort of our 10 cents on the flow of airships because I know we have talked about the Kickstarter before and we have kind of looked at uh, the components a few times. We've interviewed uh, Max and whatnot as well. But we've never really sort of stood here and sort of shouted at you as much about the actual gameplay and what it does. Uh, so hopefully um, 
we've managed to do that a little bit for you now too. Uh, any comments, any thoughts, uh, fire them in, but uh, do go and check it out for your good selves. As I say, still five days to play with, depending on where we've bothered putting this up. I'll try my best. If it's less than that, tough. You've got less. Consider there's only two days, so make it, make it snappy. Thanks for watching, folks. Catch you later.